Good afternoon everyone, I'm Robert from El Magnifico Games and tonight we're going to have another poetry, prose and riddles stream. So, regarding the poetry, last week I believe we had just finished reading the selection of poems in this compendium compendium from um, it was Robert Browning as always we will recap the last poem before we move on So, this poem from Robert Browning is entitled Epilogue. At the midnight in the silence of the sleep time, when you set your fancies free, will they pass to where, by death, falls think imprisoned? Lo, he lies who once so loved you, whom you loved so? Pity me? Oh, to love so, be so loved, yet so mistaken, what had I on earth to do? With the slothful, with the mawkish, with the with the sloth my apologies, with the slothful, with the mawkish, the unmanly. Like the aimless, helpless, hopeless did I drivel, being who? One who never turned his back but marched breast forward, never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed, though right though right were worsted, wrong would triumph. Held we fall to rise, are baffled to fight better, sleep to wake. No, at noonday in the bustle of man's work time, greet the unseen, greet the unseen with a cheer, bid him forward, breast and back as either should be, strive and thrive, cry, speed, fight on, forever, there as here. I think I may uh, attempt that one again, I think I made a bit of a pig's ear of that reading. So, once more. At the midnight in the silence of the sleep time, when you set your fancies free, will they pass to where by death falls think imprisoned, lo he lies who once so loved you, whom you loved so pity me? O oh, to love so, be so loved, yet so mistaken, what had I on earth to do, with the slothful, with the mawkish, the unmanly, like the aimless, helpless, hopeless, did I drivel, being who? One who never turned his back but marched press forward, never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed, the right were worsted, wrong would triumph. Held we fall to rise, are baffled to fight better, sleep to wake. No. At the noonday in the bustle of man's work time, greet the unseen with a cheer. Bid him forward, breast and back as either should be. Strive and thrive, cry, speed, fight on forever. There is here. So as I recall, I had some difficulty understanding this poem, even still, clearly it is about a loved one that has passed on, clearly it both has themes of regret, a 
at least I believe so as well as what the speaker believes the right attitude towards life and apparently the afterlife um, should be to the extent that I understand it it seems nice do we have anything else to add to about this one or shall we move on Jenny says, strive and thrive. Sounds like fighting. Well, to thrive means to do extremely well. And to strive is obviously to try hard. So, I'm not sure I would read fighting into that. I think fight on could be taken more literally to mean fighting, although I suspect it means it more in the metaphorical sense, again to try very hard. Relate, uh, Jenny says, relating fighting with sleep time, I imagine he was expressing that he felt sorry for those who passed away in the wars. I didn't get that sense personally. I mean, that could have been an inspiration for the poem. The first paragraph, of course, being... At the midnight in the silence of the sleep time, when you set your fancies free, or they passed away by death falls, think imprisoned. Lo, he lies who once so loved you, whom you loved so, pity me. So I think this is clearly about an individual who the listener once was loved by and loved. That could, of course, be someone that died in a war, but it needn't necessarily. What I find particularly confusing, though, is the way that it seems to swap between talking in the third, the uh, the second person and the first person. I mean, even in that paragraph, at the end, we see exactly that sort of thing. Lo, he lies who once so loved you, whom you loved so, pity me. It's a interesting... It's interesting but confusing, I find, that they're changing the person. It's not clear whether the speaker is this person who's passed on, as the later paragraphs would seem to suggest. But if so, why is he referring to himself in the second person? If it is one in the same person as I suspect it is, then I'd say the second paragraph lays out their regrets third paragraph lays out the expectations they failed to meet, that is the expectations they put upon themselves and they failed to meet in life, and then the final one concludes with a paragraph which seemingly encouraging the reader to, or listener, to wish any wayward spirits around them to keep trying hard and not to give up. There is here. So. 
Shall we move on? Or is there anything else that anyone in chat would like to discuss? Let's move on then. Now, the next selection of poems come from Robert Burns. So, let's look him up briefly. So, 1759 to 1796, so he's a Georgian individual. He was a Scottish poet and lyricist. He's widely regarded as the National Poet of Scotland and is celebrated worldwide. He is best known of the poets who have written in the Scots language, although much of his writing is in a light Scots dialect of English, accessible to an audience beyond Scotland. He also wrote in standard English, and in these writings his political or civil commentary is often at its bluntest. He is regarded as a pioneer of the Romantic movement, and after his death he became a great source of inspiration to the founders of both liberalism and socialism, and is a cultural icon in Scotland and among the Scottish diaspora around the world. The Scottish diaspora consists of Scottish people who emigrated from Scotland and their descendants. The celebration of his life and work became almost a national charismatic cult during the 19th and 20th centuries, and his influence has long been as strong as on, has long been strong on Scottish literature. In 2009, he was chosen as the greatest Scot by the Scottish public in a vote run by Scottish television channel STV. As well as making original compositions, Burns also collected folk songs from across Scotland, often revising or adapting them. His poem and song, Auld, Auld Lang Syne, is often sung at Hogmanay, the last day of the year, and Scots Wahai served for a long time as an unofficial national anthem of the country. Other poems and songs of Burns that remain well known across the world include A Red Red Rose, A Man's A Man for a That, To a Loose, To a Mouse, The Battle of Shiramir, Shiramur, hmm. Tam uh, Shanter, and I Fond Kiss. I do apologise for my atrocious pronunciation. And he says, interesting, his name is Burns, and this poem is about wars, deep and bloody. Which poem is about wars? Oh, two in the middle. We will get to that very shortly. So, that's who he was. So, the first poem, which appears to be in two parts, is called The Silver Tassie. Now, I don't know what a tassie is, so that's probably worth looking up. Scotland, a cup or goblet for drinking wine. That's probably what it is then. Being says he is, of course, Scottish.
and the first line seems to confirm that. Go fetch to me a pint of wine, and fill it in a silver tassie, that I may drink before I go, a service to my bonny lassie. That boat rocks at the pier leaf, through loud the wind blows fray the ferry. The ship rides by the Berwick law, and I mourn leave my bonny Mary. The trumpets sound, the banners fly, the glittering spears are ranked ready. The shouts of war are heard afar, the battle closes deep and bloody. It's not the roar of sea or shore, but would make me languor wish to tarry. Nor shouts of war that heard afar is leaving thee, my bonny Mary. Oh, that is indeed a very romantic poem. I wonder what era it was supposed to be representing. Because of course he refers to ranks of spears. I'm trying to think if there would be any spears in battles in the mid 1700s in Europe. Certainly, if you went back a hundred years further, there would have been. Because musketry was still fairly primitive, and if you went a hundred years later, to the mid-1800s, you would not have had spears in battles in Europe, because everyone would have been using, using rifles by then. So... I actually don't know quite what the state of warfare was in the mid-1700s. Assuming that's roughly the time this would have been written. But I suppose it does demonstrate that within living memory when this poem was written, people would remember having fought in battles where there were ranks of spears. So it's entirely possible that this reference to ranks of spears is is being it's a cultural reference as opposed to one which is trying to be entirely historic. It's possible that this is supposed to be historic, but not necessarily. If it is a reference to a specific battle, I don't know, but I suspect not. So, on to the second reading, I suppose. Go fetch to me a pint of wine, and fill it in a silver tassie, that I may drink before I go, a service to my bonny lassie. The boat rocks at the pier o' leaf, through loud the wind blows fra the ferry, the ship rides by Berwick law, and I mourn leave my bonny Mary. The trumpets sound, the banners fly, the glittering spears are ranked ready, the shouts of war are heard afar. The battle closes deep and bloody. It's not the roar of sea or shore would make me longer wish to tarry, nor shelter of war that's heard afar is leaving thee, my bonny Mary. Mary. That's interesting, actually, because he's clearly rhyming tarry with Mary, which makes me wonder if, in his Scottish dialect, they would have rhymed. It could have been pronounced Mary. The alternative would be for Terry to be pronounced Terry, which I think is less likely. Still, I can see a... I can see that every other line rhymes. So... 
Tessie and Lassie, Fairy and Mary, Reddy and Bloody almost rhyme, Terry and Mary almost rhyme. Again, I wonder if they would have rhymed in the Scottish dialect of the day. In the first paragraph I can see that there seems to be a consistent pattern of eight syllables followed by nine I believe. Let's see if that also works in the second. Yes, I believe it is consistent. You have a line of eight syllables, then a line of nine syllables, then a line of eight syllables, then a line of nine syllables that rhymes with the previous line of nine syllables, and so on and so forth in sets of four lines. So that will certainly set a rhythm. I don't think there's a meter. No, I don't think so. Yes, because it in A none of those would be stressed so there certainly isn't a meter here or at least not one that I can recognize but still very impressive work to not only create a, a poem which makes sense is emotive but also has a um, syllabic structure and a rhyming structure. So chat, how do we feel about this poem?
Whitney says, It appears to me that the poet was expressing his anti-war sentiments. An interesting thought. I don't think it's intrinsically anti-war, but it's certainly not painting war in a positive light, so you may well be right. Right, so, on to the final reading, I suppose. Unless there's more to discuss. Go fetch to me a pint of wine and fill it in a silver tassie that I may drink before I go of service to my bonny lassie. The boat rocks at the pier of leaf. Through loud the wind blows through the ferry. The ship rides by the Berwick law and I mourn leave my bonny Mary. The trumpets sound, the banners fly, the glittering spears are ranked ready. The shouts of war are heard afar, the battle closes deep and bloody. It's not the roar of sea or shore would make me longer wish to tarry, nor shouts of war that's heard afar is leaving thee, my bonny Mary. It is interesting that he explicitly says that it's not the shouts of war that are heard afar that makes him want to wait longer before going. So he's clearly, he's making it clear that he's not afraid of the war. He just wants to be with the one he loves. So is there any more to discuss with that one do you think or shall we move on? So let's move on then. I don't know how to pronounce that word, nor its meaning. I think it's just a different way of spelling art. Unfortunately, I can't read the IPA well enough. Just check it against the word art, shouldn't I? That would be the easiest and quickest way. Okay, it is pronounced differently. Ah, that's the long open R sound in art. So. What would that be? Just a second.
think it's Ert. So it's of A, the Ert's. Which I think means of all the arts. So, let us begin with the first reading. Of A, the arts, the wind can blow. I dearly like the West, for there the bonny lassie lives, the lassie I love best. The wild woods grow and rivers row, and money a hill between, but day and night my fancy's flight is ever with my jean. I see her in the dewy flowers, I see her sweet and fair, I hear her in the tuneful birds, and I hear her charm the air. There's not a bonny flower that springs by fountain shore or green, there's not a bonny bird that sings, but minds me o' oh my jean. Because how would a wind blow and how would a wind blow an art? be the other sense from northern Miglinglish art district locality quarter of the compass direction area that makes sense and I assume it has the same pronunciation so we have uh, once again of all the arts, <laughs> my apologies. Of ah the earths, the wind can blow. I dearly like the west, for there the bonny lassie lives, the lassie I love best. The wild woods grow and rivers row, and money a hill between. But day and night my fancy's fly is ever with my jean. I see her in the dewy flowers, I see her sweet and fair, I see her in the tuneful birds, I hear her charm the air. There's not a bonny flower that springs, by fountain shore or green, there's not a bonny bird that sings, but minds me on my jean. It's a very nice romantic poem, isn't it? I, I think. What do you think, chat? Jenny says, I hear her charm in the air. How come it sounds like that her is not a human being? I'm sorry, I don't quite follow you there. Could you explain? 
Or left or right? Jenny says the second half of the poem, sorry if I go too fast, but it seems to me that the real meanings, messages of the poems are usually at the end. Ah, it's, I hear her charm the air rather than I hear her charm in the air. So I think it's a... he's describing how when she's around the air itself seems more pleasant. It's not a reference to anything like levitation. So how do we feel about the poem? Okay, well I feel it's quite a, a nice little romantic piece as I put it. So, as I, as, I, uh, as I said before, so we'll move on to the final reading. Of Ah, the... My apologies. Of Ah, the earth, the wind can blow. I dearly like the west. For there the bonny lassie lives, the lassie I love best. There wild woods grow and rivers roll, and mony a hill between. But day and night my fancy's flight is ever with my jean. I see her in the dewy flowers, I see her sweet and fair. I hear her in the tuneful birds, I hear her charm the air. There's not a bonny flower that springs, by fountain shore or green. There's not a bonny bird that sings, but minds me of my jean. probably should have said this before, but we do seem to have another rhyming structure here. West and best, between and gene, fair and air, green and gene. I think springs and sings may, but I'm sure it was deliberate, but since the third, the first and third lines in any four-line group doesn't rhyme otherwise. I assume that was a is not really a structure.
don't think there's a syllabic structure this time. Which also rules out any form of any form of meter. But it is notable that the lines are roughly the same length and that the there's a general convention that the second and fourth lines in any four line group it will be shorter than the first and third. So there's still some tendencies there, if not a strict structure. Anyway, moving on. John Anderson, my Joe. John Anderson, my Joe John, when we were first acquaint, your locks were like the raven, your bonny brow was brent. But now your brow is bell, John, your locks are like the snore. But blessings on your frosty pot, John Anderson, my Joe. John Anderson, my Joe John, we climb the hill together. A money a canty day, John, we've had with an anither. Now we mourn totter down, John, and hand in hand we'll go and sleep the gither at the foot. John Anderson, my Joe. Now there's a few words there I didn't recognise. Brent Scotland, smooth or unwrinkled. Belled. for what belled might mean in this context. One would assume that if it's that it's the opposite of Brent therefore meaning wrinkled, but I can't find any support for that.
physical dictionary doesn't seem to have a convincing definition either. Oh. particularly the scalpel pat upon which hair normally grows. So that makes sense. Canty. Nope, nor can I find a good reference for Canty. Okay, so, time for the second reading. John Anderson, my Joe John, when we were first acquaint, your locks were like the raven, your bonny brow was brent, but now your brow is belled, John, your locks are like the snar, but blessings on your frosty pow. John Anderson, my Joe. John Anderson, my Joe John, we climb the hill forgither, and money a canty day, John, we've had with an anither. Now we mum totter down, John, and hand in hand we'll go and sleep together at the foot, John Anderson, my Joe. Mon, that's another one that I'm not sure about to have to must so now we must totter down if that makes sense so how do we feel about this poem
Well, I would note that yet again the poem seems to be about being in love with someone. Although this time it seems to be talking about a, a long-lasting relationship as opposed to the previous poems which haven't necessarily. It expresses having a love interest, although in the previous poems it wasn't clear whether this is a, a new love interest or not, whereas in this one it's clear that they have been together for some time. The speaker and their... and the object of their affection. Again, it's nice in its way. Certainly reflects sentiments of constancy. I think I preferred the other two. This one is also notable as it's been written from the perspective of a woman, whereas the previous two were written from the perspective of a man. But yes, it's quite nice, although it's... As I say, I think I prefer the other two. Anything to add, chat? Okay, then we'll... Um, well, let's look at what structures are present quickly. Again, we have this second and fourth lines rhyme in a four line group I can't I can't see any meter but it does it is notable that m many of the lines are all seven syllables long and when they're not they're either six or eight so again there is a tendency to try and keep the length of each verse each line consistent so on to the final reading John Anderson my Joe John when we were first acquaint your locks were like the raven your bonny brow was brent 
But now your brow is bowed, John. Your locks are like the snow. But blessings on your frosty pal, John Anderson, my Joe. John Anderson, my Joe John, we climb the hill together. And money a canty day, John, we've had with an anither. Now we mon totter down, John, and hand in hand we'll go. And sleep together at the foot, John Anderson, my Joe. So. Moving on. A fond kiss. I'm guessing that is a dialectical spelling of A. That's pronounced air, air fond kiss, and it means one apparently. So, for the first reading, air fond kiss, and then we sever, a farewell, and then forever. Deep in heart wrung tears, I'll pledge thee. Wearing sighs and groans, I'll wage thee. Who shall say that fortune grieves him, while the stars of hope she leaves him? Me, thy cheerful twinkle lights me, dark despair around benights me. I'll never blame my partial fancy. Nothing can resist my Nancy, but to see her was to love her, love but her and love forever. Had we never loved, say kindly. Had we never loved to say blindly, never met or never parted, we had never been broken hearted. Fare thee well, thou first and fairest, fare thee well, thou best and dearest, thine be ilka joy and treasure, peace, enjoyment, love and pleasure, I fond kiss and then we sever. E farewell, alas, forever, deep in heart wrung tears I'll pledge thee. Wearing sighs and groans, I'll wage thee. So we'll start with the words I don't recognize. And if anyone in chat wants clarification on any words, please just ask. Wearing or warring hmm. It does seem to be warring I assumed it was another dialectical word, but it doesn't seem to be. I think that is warring sighs and groans. Although I don't fully comprehend that. How could sighs and groans be warring? night I wonder if it is actually a word or if that's a word that the poet has coined oh it does appear to be a word oh, my apologies let me bring up the browser to darken to shroud or obscure to plunge or to be overwhelmed in moral or intellectual darkness
I suspect that partial, impartial fantasy is probably the same sense as an impartial. So being biased in favour of a person. Say. Means so. So had we never loved so kindly, had we never loved so blindly, never met or never parted, would never have been broken hearted. It is notable that this poem appears to have the first and second lines rhyme in every two line group, which is different to the previous ones. Ilka. Each or every. Thine be Ilka joy and treasure. Okay. second reading. A fond kiss and then we sever, a farewell and then forever, deep in heart wrung tears I'll pledge thee, warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee, who shall say that fortune grieves him, while the star of hope she leaves him, me, thy cheerful twinkle le lights me, dark despair around benights me, I never blame my partial fancy, nothing could resist my Nancy, but to see her was to love her, love but her, and love forever. Had we never loved say kindly, had we never loved to say blindly, never met or never parted, we'd never been broken hearted. Fare thee well, thou first and fairest, fare thee well, thou best and dearest, thine be ilka joy and treasure, peace, enjoyment, love and pleasure. A fond kiss and then we sever, a farewell, alas, forever, Deep in heart wrung tears I'll pledge thee, warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. So we've established there's a rhyming structure, is there a syllabic structure? So again, I can't see any syllabic structure, although I do note that all the verses seem to tend towards eight syllables. If they're not eight syllables, then they seem to be nine, or I think seven.
No, I think it's just eight and nine. But in no clear structure. It's impressive though. To both stick broadly to a number of syllables and rhyme and make sense and be emotive. And again, I don't detect any sort of meter. I could be wrong, but I don't see it. Genesis, I think in these three poem sessions, there are several expressions that we normally don't use anymore today. This explains why they are difficult to understand. An example is fare thee well, meaning farewell for now. Going back to the first sign when the uh, poet said we, who was, were he talking to? who was were he he staying with I think it is assumed that each poem is being presented from the point of view of a speaker and over the course of the poem we will discover more about both themselves and the person or persons with whom they speak to or talk about so in this case, yet again, it appears to be to a romantic couple. Although in this case, the this poem seems to be about separating. I don't think it discusses why, but it seems to be about a painful separation. Apparently mutual and without a lot of hard feelings, at least so far as I can see. Nevertheless, this is definitely a poem about love lost. So how do we feel about the poem? Well, again, I think the romantic themes are moving, and I appreciate the craftsmanship that have gone into them. I think it's a beautiful poem taken on its own. I think I prefer it to the last poem. But to be honest, having these extremely romantic poems back to back is beginning to seem a little mawkish. But other than that, it seems very nice to me. So, shall we move on to the final reading now? Or is there anything else you'd like to discuss? Okay, I'll move on to the final reading for now. A fond kiss and then we sever, a farewell and then forever. Deep in heart wrung tears I'll pledge thee, warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. Who shall say that fortune grieves him, while the star of hope she leaves him? Mean a cheerful twinkle lights me, 
dark despair around benights me. I'll never blame my partial fancy. Nothing could resist my Nancy. But to see her was to love her. Love but her and love forever. Had we never loved so kindly. Had we never loved to say blindly. Never met or never parted. We had never been broken hearted. Fare thee well, thou first and fairest. Fare thee well, thou best and dearest. Thine be ilka joy and treasure. Peace, enjoyment, love and pleasure. A fond kiss and then we sever. A farewell, alas, forever. Deep in heart wrung tears I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. In that final reading, it has just occurred to me that warring in warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee isn't being used as an adjective as I'd initially interpreted it. It's being used as a verb in the present continuous tense. So it's with the the speaker is saying to the listener who is, it would appear, the object of their affection that I bet you are warring with sighs and groans. As in, and heart wrung it. Oh no, that's the previous line. But yes, warring sighs and groans. Um, so you're sighing and groaning because of the emotional pain you're going through. I'll wage thee. So that makes sense. Anyway. I think that will do for poetry this week. So unless there's anything anyone would like to add. No? Okay, then we'll move on to more Pride and Prejudice. Now, before we begin, we should pro probably recap what's happened so far. So in chapter one, we were introduced to the Bennets. That's of course being Mrs. Bennet, Mr. Bennet, Jane, the first daughter, Elizabeth the second, Mary the middle, Catherine the fourth, also known as Kitty, and Lydia the fifth. We also learned that a Mr. Bingley had recently moved into Neverfield, which is a local estate. In chapter 2, we learn something of Mr. Bennett's sense of humour, in that during these times it appears that if two families wished to be acquainted within society, they had to be... that there was an initial protocol for establishing relations, and that would involve the... the senior male of one household going to visit the senior male of the other and thus in that visit they become introduced and then it's expected that the visit will be returned as all visits were expected to be returned back then. Now, regarding Mr. Bennett's sense of humour in Chapter 2, it was because in Chapter 1 his wife and daughters had asked him to visit Mr. Bingley at his earliest convenience because the daughters were particularly interested in marrying an eligible young gentleman such as Mr. Bingley and so naturally wanted to get to know him. And it seems Mr. Bennett did visit him fairly early on, but didn't reveal to his family that he had done so, and actually kept that secret for as long as he could. And then 
just happened to mention it in passing in a conversation. So that's what we learn about him in chapter 2. In chapter 3, the family already are aware that Mr. Bennett had visited Mr. Bingley and I believe the visit had been returned at that point but Mr. Bennett wouldn't provide an adequate description of Mr. Bingley to his daughters or wife again emphasizing a sense of humor after that an invitation to a ball is sent to the family the family accept and at the ball they meet the Hurst family, or members thereof, Mr. Darcy, of course Mr. Bingley, and I believe there were other families there like the Lucases, although they didn't feature very heavily in the, that particular chapter. The Hurst, I believe, is Mr. Hurst and Mrs. Hurst. Mrs. Hurst being Mr. Bingley's eldest sister, I believe. I could be wrong. During chapter three, we have Mr. Darcy choosing to sit out from the dancing, which is not really the done thing when you're a young single gentleman but that was his choice uh, the reason he gave is that he only dances with people he's particularly well acquainted with or who really especially take his fancy for some other reason and it would seem because he was sitting out that they didn't have the right numbers of people for the dance and so it turns out that Elizabeth Bennett, the second oldest daughter in the Bennett family, also had to sit out because there wasn't a free partner for her. Mr. Darcy then, when Mr. Bingley approached him and pointed out that he should be dancing and pointing out that there was a nice young lady available whom he could dance with. He then slighted her by pointing out that he didn't have any interest in dancing with her and besides she had clearly been turned down by some other gentleman and so it wouldn't reflect well on him if he was dancing with a woman who had already been slighted in that way. Which, of course, there was no truth in that, and that statement in itself was a slight against Elizabeth. In, in other ways as well, Mr. Darcy singled himself out at the ball as being somewhat arrogant, and despite people having usually a very good impression of him when they first saw him, because apparently he was handsome and very well cultured and well spoken he apparently it seems very shortly after people took a dislike to him in general in chapter 4 we see Jane and Elizabeth talking and in particular the subject of the differences between Mr. Uh, Darcy and Mr. Bingley are stressed I should have said Mr. Darcy is of course a friend of Mr. Bingley who seems to spend and they, they seem to spend a lot of their time together that was largely the content of chapter 4 in chapter 5 we get properly introduced to the Lucases who are another local family and Charlotte Lucas it is revealed is a very good friend of Elizabeth Bennett I believe the Lucases were at the ball and so the discussion of the events at the ball are a point of interest for the uh, for both families. In chapter six, we, it's revealed that Mr. Darcy, despite his attitude towards Elizabeth previously, is now falling in love with her. In chapter seven, 
in chapter 7, we find out that Catherine and Lydia, the two youngest Bennet daughters, have been travelling quite regularly to see Mrs. Spirit, Mrs. Phillips in Meryton, which is a local settlement, and they are particularly interested that a group of soldiers have been stationed in Meryton recently and having ideas of how dashing a young man in uniform is and all that, they go out of their way to see that they're visiting Mrs. Phillips even more than they had previously and trying to stay up to date on all the gossip about the soldiers. We also, in chapter 7, see Jane travelling to Neverfield to visit. I should say that up till this point there had apparently been a certain degree of visiting between the Bennets and the Bingleys, although in particular I believe the Bingleys were, that is Mr Bingley and his sisters seemed most interested in Jane and Elizabeth, if I recall correctly, not having much interest in the younger daughters or the parents whom they seem to have a low opinion of. Anyway, uh, we, as I say, in Chapter 7, Jane goes to visit at Neverfield, but when asked whether she can take the family's carriage, she is turned down and ends up going on horseback on a day when it comes to rain. This, it seems, was on her mother's mind because her mind deliberately wanted her mother deliberately wanted Jane to go on horseback in the rain in the hopes that she would fall ill and then have to stay at Neverfield Mansion in the hopes that that might create a situation where romance is allowed to blossom between her and Mr. Darcy. Sorry, not Mr. Darcy, I meant Mr. Bingley. My apologies. Between Jane and Mr. Bingley. Who there seems to be a mutual interest. They both seem to be drawn to each other. But of course in those times it would be unthinkable for a young woman to just stay over a at a gentleman's house for social or recreational reasons and so she had to fall ill to allow this to happen that was what Mrs. Bennet hoped would happen and indeed that is exactly what happens the chapter concludes with Elizabeth well the Towards the end of the chapter, a message is sent from Neverfield to the Bennets' home to inform them that their daughter has fallen ill and will be staying the night. This then prompts Elizabeth the next day to wish to visit her sister, who she's very close to. And as uh, she also isn't permitted to use the carriage, and it appears they don't have any free horses or for some other reason horses weren't an option she ends up walking there which is several miles away oh, through fields and it appears and as is pointed out later on that seems to not be the usual done thing of a lady of her station to go rambling through fields for several miles but anyway she does so in chapter 8, we see Elizabeth, who has now, is now visiting Neverfield, being treat and treated as a bit of an odd one out in the household. The, the family's estimation of her seems to have gone down due to her walking alone to get there through fields, which they deem to be unwise, and no sensible person would do that. No sensible person of her station, anyway. The fact that she'd prefer to read a book than play cards when the offer is made. Um, so for those reasons Elizabeth is looked down upon we also have a conversation in which Mr Darcy 
seems to put forward some particularly high standards he has before he would uh, regard a woman as accomplished. This concludes with Mr. Hurst calling everyone to pay attention to the game of cards, which is what they were notionally doing before uh, s several conversations broke out, and it's agreed that Mr. Jones, the apothecary, will be sent for in the morning to look at Jane, as she is still not getting better. In Chapter 9, Mrs. Bennett visits Jane, and she finds that she she, in her opinion, Jane isn't in too bad health, which means that she's not worried, and as a result, she wants to ensure that she stays here as long as possible. So she makes out that she's in very bad health and needs and should not be disturbed, as in she should be left there in the bed in Neverfield. Uh, the apothecary visits and comes to largely the same conclusion, it seems. We also have several discussions between the various people who reside in Neverfield and their guests, including Mrs. Bennett. We also see Lydia, who is also visiting, pressuring Mr. Bingley into keeping some promise about holding a ball, which he had apparently previously made. And Lydia is hoping that once Jane has recovered, they will. this ball will not only be held as had been promised but that some of the local soldiery will turn up who she could meet officers I should think then in chapter 10 we find out that Jane's finally getting better we see the differences between Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy's personality stressed in a conversation which begins on the topic of letter writing as Mr. Darcy was writing a letter at the time but then uh, moves on to other topics. Towards the end, Mr. Darcy, towards the end, we have some music being played by one of Mr. Bingley's sisters. And Mr. Bingley asks Elizabeth if she'd like to dance. And Elizabeth, first of all, thinks that he's being sarcastic or otherwise not entirely or otherwise being disingenuous in some way so it doesn't reply and then when he asks again she apologizes for not replying and turns him down then to, at the very end of the chapter we have a scene where Elizabeth is walking the grounds with Mrs. Hurst when they bump into Mr. Bingley, uh, sorry, Miss Bingley, which I assume must be Mr. Bingley's younger sister, since if I recall correctly, his older sister was married, could be wrong, and Mr. Darcy. And then they attempt to walk together, but it becomes clear that the path is only wide enough to admit three of them, and so Elizabeth quite happily peels off and starts rambling on her own. Despite the fact that Mr. Darcy does try to suggest that they walk somewhere else where there will be room for all four of them, she doesn't seem interested. She'd rather be alone. And that's where we left off at the end of Chapter 10. So, on to chapter 11. When the ladies removed after dinner, Elizabeth ran up to her sister, and seeing her well, guarded from cold, attended her into the drawing room, where she was welcomed by her two friends with many professions of pleasure. And Elizabeth had never seen them so agreeable as they were during the hour which passed before the gentlemen appeared. Their powers of conversation were considerable. They could describe an entertainment with accuracy, relate an anecdote with humour, and laugh at their acquaintance with spirit. When the gentleman entered, Jane was no longer the first object. Miss Bingley's eyes were instantly turned toward Darcy. She had something to say to him before he had advanced many steps. He addressed himself to Miss Bennet with a polite congratulation. 
Mr. Hurst also made a slight bow and said he was very glad, but the diffuseness and warmth remained for Bingley's salutation. He was so full of joy and attention. The first half hour was spent in piling up the fire, lest she should suffer from the change of room, and she and she removed at his desire to the other side of the fireplace that she might be further from the door. He then sat down by her and talked scarcely to anyone else. Elizabeth, at work in the opposite corner, saw it all with great delight. When tea was over, Mr. Hurst reminded his sister-in-law of the card table, but in vain. She had obtained private intelligence that Mr. Darcy did not wish for cards, and Mr. Hurst soon found even his open petition rejected. She assured him that no one intended to play, and the silence of the whole party on the subject seemed to justify her. Mr. Hurst had therefore nothing to do but to stretch himself on one of the sofas and go to sleep. Darcy took up a book. Miss Bingley did the same. And Mrs. Hurst, principally occupied in playing with her bracelets and rings, joined now and then in her brother's conversation with Miss Bennet. Miss Bingley's attention was quite as much engaged in watching Mr. Darcy's progress with his book as in reading her own, and she was perpetually either making some inquiry or looking at his page. Miss Bingley, I... Ah, yes. Um, that's, I assume, the younger sister? Again, because unless I'm mistaken, I believe the older sister's married. Being uh, Mrs. Hurst. She could not win with him, however, to any conversation. He merely answered her question and read on. At length, quite exhausted by the attempt to be amused with her own book, which she had only chosen because it was the second volume of his, she gave a great yawn and said, How pleasant it is to spend an evening in this way. I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. How much sooner one tires of anything than of a book. When I have a house of my own, I shall be miserable if I have not an excellent library. No one made any reply. She then yawned again, threw aside her book, and cast her eyes round the room in, quiet for some, in quest for some amusement. When hearing her brother mentioning a ball to Miss Bennet, she turned suddenly towards him and said, By the by, Charles, are you really serious in meditating a dance at Neverfield? I would advise you, before you determine on it, to consult the wishes of the present party. I am much mistaken if there are not some among us to whom a ball would rather be a punishment than a pleasure. If you mean Darcy, cried her brother, he may go to bed if he chooses before it begins. But as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing, and as soon as Nicole's has made white soup enough, I shall send round my cards. That's interesting. I wonder what they mean by white soup. Obviously I'm familiar with having a white base for a soup. But this seems... But I wonder if this is some form of soup stock they're referring to, and because they feel they would need soup at the ball that they need to have enough made up hmm, I can't see a specific reference to it online so we'll just have to move on Now Charles, I believe, is Mr. Bingley. I believe, if I recall correctly, he's Charles Bingley, and um, this is Miss Bingley speaking. So, I should like the balls infinitely better. She replied, "If they, if they were carried on in a different manner, but there is something insufferably tedious in the usual process of such a meeting." It would surely be much more rational if conversations instead of dancing were made the order of the day. Much more rational, my dear Caroline, I dare say, but would not be near so much like a ball. Miss Bingley made no answer, and soon afterwards she got up and walked about the room. Her figure was elegant, and she walked well, but Darcy, at whom it was all aimed, was still inflexibly studious. In the desperation of her feelings, she resolved on one effort more, and turning to Elizabeth said, Miss Eliza Bennet, let me persuade you to follow my example and take a turn about the room. I assure you it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one attitude. 
Elizabeth was surprised but agreed to it immediately. Miss Bingley succeeded no less in the real object of her civility. Mr. Darcy looked up. He was as much awake to the novelty of attention in that quarter as Elizabeth herself could be, and unconsciously closed his book. He was directly invited to join the party, but he declined, observing that he could imagine but two motives for their choosing to walk up and down the room together, with either of which motives his joining would interfere. What could he mean? She was dying to know uh, what could be his meaning, and asked Elizabeth whether she could at all understand him. Not at all, was her answer, but depend upon it, he means to be severe on us, and our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. Miss Bingley, however, was incapable of disappointing Mr. Darcy in anything, and persevered, therefore, in requiring an explanation of his two motives. I have not the smallest objection to explaining them, said he, as soon as he was allowed to speak. As soon as she allowed him to speak. I apologise. You either choose this method of passing the evening because you are in each other's confidence and have secret affairs to discuss, or because you are conscious that your figures appear to the greatest advantage in walking. If the first, I will be completely in your way, and if the second, I could admire you much better as I sit by the fire. Oh, shocking, cried Miss Bingley. I never heard anything so abominable. How shall we punish him for such a speech? Nothing so easy, if you have but the inclination, said Elizabeth. We can all plague and punish one another, tease him, laugh at him, intimate as you are. You must know how it is to be done. But upon my honour, I do not. I do assure you that my intimacy has not yet taught me that. T's calmness of manner and presence of mind, no, no, I fear he may defy us there, and as to laughter, he will not expose, we will not expose ourselves, if you please, by attempting to laugh about a subject. Mr. Darcy may hug himself. I'm not familiar with that expression to hug oneself. Anyway, moving on. Mr. Darcy is not to be laughed at, cried Elizabeth. That is an uncommon advantage, and uncommon I hope it will continue, for it would be a great loss to me to have many such acquaintances. I dearly love a laugh. Miss Bingley, said he, has given me more credit than can be. The wisest and best of men. Nay, the wisest and best of their actions may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly, replied Elizabeth, there are such people, but I hope I am not one of them. I hope I never ridicule what is wise and good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can, but these, I suppose, are precisely what you are without. Perhaps that is not possible for anyone. But it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule. Such as vanity and pride? Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed, but pride, where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will always under good will always be under good regulation. Elizabeth turned away to hide a smile. Your examination of Mr Darcy is over, I presume, said Miss Bingley. And I pray what is the result? I am perfectly convinced by it that Mr. Darcy has no defect. He owns it himself without disguise. No, said Darcy, I have made no such pretension. I have faults enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. My temper I dare not vouch for. It is, I believe, too little yielding. Certainly too little for the convenience of the world. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others so soon as I ought, nor their offences against myself. My feelings are not puffed about with every attempt to move them. My temper would perhaps be called resentful. My good opinion once lost is lost forever. That is a failing indeed, cried Elizabeth. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character. 
but you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me. There is, I believe, an Esri disposition of tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect is to hate everybody. And yours, he replied with a smile, is willfully to misunderstand them. Do let us have a little music, cried Miss Bingley, tired of a conversation in which she had no share. Louisa, you will not mind my walking, Miss waking Mr. Hurst? Her sister had not the smallest objection, and the piano forte was opened, and Darcy, after a few moments' recollec recollection, was not sorry for it. He began to feel the danger of paying Elizabeth too much attention. So, that was chapter 11. Chapter 12. In consequence of an agreement between the sisters, Elizabeth wrote the next morning to their mother to beg that the carriage might be sent for them in the course of the day. Mrs. Bennet, who had calculated on her daughter's remaining at, Never remaining at Neverfield till the following Tuesday, which would exactly finish Jane's week, uh, could not bring herself to receive them with pleasure before. Her answer, therefore, was not uh, propitious. Propitious? apparently, although that is a US pronunciation. Favourable benevolent. Char characteristic of a good omen. So therefore was not propitious, at least not to Elizabeth's wishes, for she was impatient to get home. Mrs. Bennet sent them a word that they could not possibly have the carriage before Tuesday, and in a postscript it was added that if Mr. Bingley and his sisters pressed them to stay longer, she could spare them very well. Against staying longer, however, Elizabeth was positively re resolved, nor did she much expect it would be asked, and fearful on the contrary as being considered as intruding themselves needlessly long. She urged Jane to borrow Mr. Bingley's carriage immediately, and at length it was settled that their original design of leaving Neverfield that morning should be mentioned and the request made. The communication excited many professions of concern, and enough was said of wishing them to stay at least till the following day to work on Jane until the morrow um, their going was deferred. Miss Bingley was then sorry that she had proposed the delay, for her jealousy and dislike of one sister much exceeded her affection for the other. The master of the house heard with real sorrow that they were to go soon, and repeatedly tried to persuade Miss Bennet that it would not be safe for her, and that she was not enough recovered, but Jane was firm when she felt herself to be right. To Mr. Darcy it was a welcome intelligence. Elizabeth had been at Nipperfield long enough. She attracted him more than he liked, and Miss Bingley was uncivil to her, and more teasing than usual to himself. He wisely resolved to be particularly careful that no sign of admiration should now escape him, nothing that could elevate her with the hope of influencing his felicity. Sensible that if such an idea had been suggested, his behaviour during the last day must have been material weight in confirming or crushing it. Steady to his purpose, he scarcely spoke ten words to her through the whole of Saturday, and though they were at one time left by themselves for half an hour, he adhered most consciously to his book, and would not even look at her. On Sunday, after morning service, the separation, so agreeable to almost all, took place. Miss Bingley's civility to Elizabeth increased at least 
Miss Bingley's civility to Elizabeth increased at last very rapidly, as well as her affection for Jane, and when they parted, after assuring the latter of the pleasure it would always give to give her to see her either at Longbourn or Neverfield, and embracing her most tenderly, she even shook hands with the former Elizabeth. Oh, the former. Elizabeth took leave of the whole party in the liveliest of spirits. They were not welcomed home very cordially by their mother. Mrs. Bennet wondered at their coming, and thought they were very wrong to give so much trouble, and were sure Jane would have caught cold again. But their father, though very laconic in his expressions of pleasure, was really glad to see them, and he had felt their importance in the, fa in the family circle. The evening conversation, when they were all assembled, had lost much of its ammunition, and almost all its sense by the absence of Jane and Elizabeth. They found Mary, as usual, deep in the study of thorough base and human nature, and had some extracts to admire and some new observations of threadbare morality to listen to. Catherine and Lydia had information for them of a different sort, much had been done and much had been said in the regiment since the preceding Wednesday. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle. A private had been flogged and it had actually been hinted that Colonel Forster was going to be married. So, I think that will do for Pride and Prejudice this week. There's two more chapters. Is there uh, anything anyone in chat would like to discuss? So, I believe number 22 must have been the riddle which we finished on last week. So, let's reread it. What honours, what rebuffs we share, whose duty tis to serve the fair. Gay though I'm dressed as new made lord, I'm grave enough for council board. Whether I wait in silk or woollen, my lady'll now be kind to now sullen, high now in favour, straight be gone. Commended now, now trampled on, now seated by her own bedside, doomed now the wooden horse to ride, now shook perhaps or soundly beat, permitted next to kiss her feet. But though I've often borne disgrace, what boasts have envied me my place? He that my ma mistress favour gain, let him my name and post explain. And if I recall correctly, the solution to this riddle was a stocking. Oh dear, I think I revealed too many again. Stockings. Oh dear, this is rather too far in. And this is rather too far back. There we go. So, let's begin with Riddle 23. In a garden was laid a beautiful maid, as fair as the flowers in the morn. The first hour of her life, she was made a wife and she died before she was born.
Jenny said to Eve, In her garden was laid a beautiful maid, as fair as the flowers in the morn. The first hour of her life she was made a wife, and she lay died before she was born. Oh, and she died before she was born. I'm not sure I follow, could you elaborate, Jenny? said it's a time concept, that's it, sorry, I don't know how to explain. It doesn't fully figure to me. I could understand an Eve being as beautiful as the flowers in the morn, and I could understand it only lasting an hour. But I'm not sure about she was made a wife. or the reference to dying before birth. I don't have a better explanation though, so we'll see if you're correct, Jenny. It is indeed an Eve, not that I understand, though I do not understand why. Let's try 14. A sailor launched a ship of force, a cargo put therein, of course. No good said he, he wished to sell. Each wind did serve his turn as well. No pirates dreaded to, to no harbour bound. His stronger wish that he might run aground. A sailor launched a ship of force. Cargo put therein, of course. No good said he, he wished to sell. Each wind did serve his turn as well. No pirate is dreaded, to no harbour bound. His stronger wish that he might run aground.
Jenny says Noah, the Bible character. I really don't know. So, let's see if you're right, Jenny. Noah's Ark. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, it's a embarrassing I didn't see that still. On to twenty-five. Or rolling tyrant of the earth. To vilest slaves I owe my birth. How is the greatest monarch blessed when in my gaudy livery dressed? No haughty nymph has power to run from me or my embraces shun. Step to the heart, condemned to flame, my constancy is still the same. The favourite messenger of Jove and Lemnian god consulting strove to make me glorious to the sight of mortals and the gods' delight. Soon would their altar's flame expire if I refuse to lend them fire. Lemnion is over pertaining to the island of Lemnos. Jenny thinks it might be gold. For ancient Greeks, the island was sacred to Hephaestus, god of metallurgy, who, as he tells himself, in Iliad, fell on Lemnus when Zeus held him headlong out of Olympus. When he, there he was cared for by uh, Sintes, according to Iliad, or by Thetis, uh, Apollodorus Bibliotech. And there, with a Thracian nymph, Cambero, the daughter of uh, Proteus, he fathered a tribe called the Cam Caberoi. Sacred initiatory rites dedicated to them were performed in the island. Its ancient capital was named Hep Hephaestia in the god's honour. Hephaestus Forge, which was located on Lemnos, as well as the name Ithalia, sometimes applied to it, points to its volcanic character. It is said that the fire occasionally blazed forth from 
Musiklos, one of its mountains, the ancient geographer Pusenius, Porsenius relates that a small island called Chris off the Lemnian coast was swallowed up by the sea. All volcanic action is now extinct. So this certainly could suggest a link to metallurgy. All ruling tyrant of the earth, to vilest slaves I owe my birth. How is the greatest monarch blessed, when am I gaudy livery dressed? No haughty nymphs have power to run, from me or my embraces shun. Stabbed to the heart, condemned to flame, my constancy is still the same. The favourite messenger of Jove, and Lemnian god consulting, strove. To make me glorious to the sight of mortals and the gods' delight, soon would their altars flame expire if I refused to lend them fire. Well, aside from the very last line, I think that would all figure with gold, as Jenny says. I'm not sure about the link to flame except through metallurgy. I don't know a great deal about the Roman god Jupiter, but it would make sense to me. That the favorite messenger of Jove and the Lemnian god, so Hephaestus, even though this would be a mixing of Greek and Roman gods, so sort of things did happen in uh, the legends of antiquity. It would make sense that between them, they strove to make gold glorious to the sight. It would also make sense why the the, it owes its birth to the vilest slaves, those being the miners, but also why the greatest monarch is blessed in my gaudy livery, that of gold. So yes, I'm guessing it is Indeed, gold, as Jenny says. Yep, gold. Well done, Jenny. You're doing very well. Right, 26. When you and I together meet... We make up six in House or Street. When I and you do meet once more, alas, poor we can make but four. And last, when you from I are gone, I make but solitary one. Guesses from chat? I know what it is. It's the Roman numerals I and V. When you and I meet, so you, at, for this to make sense, it's necessary to understand that the characters U and V used to be the same. They certainly were in Roman times. And so when the character that we would now recognize as V was used as a vowel in a word, it would be pronounced with a U sound when it was used as a 
consonant, it would be pronounced with a V sound. Actually, no, that's not true. In Roman times, they pronounced it with a W sound. And that was before the character W had been invented. But anyway, the point of it is that the characters U and V, especially in capitals, not only look similar, but they are actually the word, the same character. So, when U and I meet together, that's VI, the Roman numeral 6. When I and U meet, that's I, V, that's 4 in Roman numerals. And when uh, U from I's are gone, I make but solitary 1, that's of course the Roman numeral 1. Yep. So, now we're on to 27. Long before Adam, one there lived, and liveth still as is believed, whose name reversed here you'll see. Ladies, pray say who this may be. I think it's devil. Lived reverses devil. I don't know why it's saying ladies pray say though, unless riddles were considered to be the domain of women when this book was released, which would seem slightly odd I would think, but you never know. But I think the answer must be the devil. Any other guesses, chat?
Okay, so let's see if I'm correct. The devil. So, on to 28. Though I, alas, a prisoner be, my trade is prisoners to set free. No slave his lord's command obeys with more insinuating ways. My genius piercing, sharp and bright, wherein the men of wit delight. The clergy keep me for their ease, and turn and wind me as they please. A new and wondrous art I show of raising spirits from below. In scarlet some and some in white, they rise, walk round, yet never fright. A greater chemist none than I, who from materials hard and dry, have taught men to extract with skill, more precious juice than from a still. Though I am often out of case, I am not ashamed to show my face, though at tables of the great, I near the sideboard take my seat. Yet this plain squire, when dinner's done, is never pleased till I make one. He kindly bids me near him stand, and often takes me by the hand. I twice a day a hunting go, forever fail to seize my foe, and when I have him by the pole, a dragging upwards from his hole. And though some are of such stubborn kind, I'm forced to leave a limb behind. I hourly wait some fatal end, for I can break but scorn to bend. So it sounds like we're dealing with some sort of tool, which is rigid. Rigid and... Brittle, rigid and brittle. Now, what I wanted to look up was specifically what they mean by a sideboard. A sideboard, also called a buffet, is an item of furniture traditionally used in the dining room for serving food, for displaying serving dishes and for storage. It usually consists of a set of cabinets or cupboards and one or more drawers, all topped by a wooden surface for conveniently holding food, serving dishes or uh, lighting devices. The word sideboard and buffet are somewhat interchangeable, but if the item has short legs or a base that sits directly on the floor with no legs, it is, likely to, it is more likely to be called a sideboard. If it has longer legs, it is more likely to be called a buffet. The earliest versions of the sideboard familiar today made their appearance in the 18th century. This was published in the... Actually, I think this may have been published at the very, very start of the 19th century, thinking about it. But gained much of their popularity during the 19th century. Double check. 
I think this may have been released uh, at some point, like 1806 or something like that. 1806. Though I, alas, a prisoner be, my trade is prisoners to set free. No slave his lord's command obeys with more insinuating ways. My genius piercing, sharp and bright, wherein the men of wit delight, the clergy keep me for their ease, and turn and wind me as they please. That would figure with a corkscrew. A new and wondrous art I show of raising spirits from below. Again. In scarlet some and some in white. Again. They rise, walk round, yet never fright. A greater chemist none than I, who from materials hard and dry have taught men to extract with skill more precious juice than from a still. This is sounding a lot like a corkscrew, as Jenny said. Although I'm often out of case, I'm not ashamed to show my face, though at the tables of the great I near the sideboard take my seat. Yet this plain squire, when dinner's done, is never pleased till I make one. Kindly bids me near his stand, and often takes me by the hand. I twice a day a hunting go, nor ever fail to seize my foe. And when I have him by the pole, I drag him upwards from his hole. Though some are of such stubborn kind, I'm forced to leave a limb behind. I hourly wait some fatal end, for I can break but scorn to bend. I think Jenny is right, it probably is a corkscrew. Here I think I may have seen a bit of the next one. A corkscrew. Well done, Jenny. Number 29. Yonder lives a shoemaker who works without leather, and strange, employs all four elements together. Of fire he makes use of, of water, earth and air, and for every customer makes a double pair. Unfortunately, I know the answer to this one because I saw it, but but chat is welcome to guess if they didn't. Any guesses, chat? It's 29 we're on.
then I believe the answer in the answer section was a blacksmith and the shoe would be a horseshoe hence why he's making a double pair and hence why all four elements are involved those being, of course, fire, water, earth, and air. Because horseshoes are made out of metal. However, if we were to be pedantic, that's not actually true, because the person who makes and fits horseshoes is actually called a farrier. But they are informally known as blacksmiths, since their profession clearly has a lot of overlap. Blacksmith. So, 30. The beginning of eternity, the end of time and space. Ooh. I didn't know the expression time and space was that old. That's very interesting. My apologies. The beginning of eternity, the end of time and space, the beginning of every end, and the end of every place. Jenny says the letter E. The beginning of eternity, the end of time and space, the beginning of every end, and the end of every place. Oh, goodness me, Jenny, you've got it in one, haven't you? You'd think I'd learn by now to... I'd have learned by now to check for linguistic answers like that. Yep, the letter E. Well done. So... I think that will do for riddles for today, which concludes our session uh, of this stream. Thank you for coming everybody, I hope you had a good time. I'll be streaming again on Friday, in which I'll be streaming some more RimWorld. Then on Monday I will be continuing my playthrough of Monkey Island 2, LeChuck's Revenge. And then come Wednesday I'll be back to streaming some more poetry, prose and riddles. If I choose to do any additional streams I'll announce them on Twitter. So, once again, thank you for coming. I hope everybody has a good evening and good night.